Hi, my name is Alex Trayman. I'm the CEO and the Jerusalem Bureau Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate. I'm coming to you live from Jerusalem, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, Yaakov Lapin, who is the uh, military affairs correspondent for JNS Jewish News Syndicate. Uh, Yaakov, it has been uh, quite an eventful uh, 24 hours here uh, in the state of Israel. Uh, obviously, the the biggest news was that uh, President Biden was here today for meetings with uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, also with Israeli President uh, Yitzhak Herzog, and also with the expanded war cabinet, which was created uh, last week uh, to deal with the this Hamas war uh, that we're in and potentially a broader conflict. And we'll we'll talk about all that a little bit later. Uh, seemed to be some overwhelming support uh, from. President Biden uh, standing with Israel. Uh, I think that most Israelis were were very uh, pleased with the statements that came out of the the various press conferences um, and, and appearances and that that the president and the prime minister made. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the military aspects, less about the the political aspects. Um, but last night, you know, Israel was in a frenzy uh, as there were reports that the IDF had struck a hospital, a Baptist hospital in the Gaza Strip. There were reports that uh, 500 were killed in a mass casualty incident, including women, children, invalids, uh, and created some kind of incredible humanitarian crisis. And, and the IDF you know, had to figure out whether that was true, whether they were able to refute that. Um, and, and it seems as though uh, not only was it a Hamas rocket or a Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket that that misfired, that was pointed towards Haifa and actually wound up striking, uh, but it didn't even strike the hospital building itself. It looks like the the detonation took place in the parking lot uh, adjacent to the hospital. The the building is still standing. There might be some damage on the facade, but the the, the hospital wasn't hit, uh, and there doesn't even seem to be any evidence of a mass casualty event. Um, Yago, maybe you could take us through what happened last night when all of a sudden the entire international press and social media was saying that Israel had created uh, this incredible humanitarian disaster striking a hospital. Uh, you know, take us through what the IDF was going through uh, in order to confirm or refute uh, those claims. Yeah. And, you know, this is really, you know, in many ways, a, a typical um chronicle of media malfunction, um, relying solely on a report by the Hamas-run um, Gazan Health Ministry, uh, which immediately knew who struck the hospital, how many people were killed. All these things were presented as, as, as fact when they were far from being verified. And then the media just sort of, the international media, large sections of it running with it. Some of them, you know, uh, writing at the end, according to Hamas sources. But of course, the main the headline is that uh, Israel allegedly committed this terrible atrocity. Now, when this kind of thing happens, you know, the Israel Defense Forces as an organized military always has a disadvantage because uh, if it rushes to deny before it's able to verify internally what happened, um, it's going to be caught uh, eventually in a falsehood. It does not want to do that, of course. So it has to take some time. Um, and the, le the amount of data that it has to go through to figure out what happened is enormous. There are hundreds of fighter jets in the air. There are unmanned aerial vehicles in the air. Um, there are naval ships firing on targets and there are ground um, firepower systems that are firing. So it has to look at all of that and it did. And it saw that none of those Israeli systems were operational systems were firing in the area of the hospital. Um, and then of course there's the video footage from multiple locations. And on top of that, um, the IDF has access to radar data, okay, and it's able to see a barrage of rockets, this cluster, being fired from a lot, basically behind the hospital, a few kilometers back, and very, very clearly just at the time that the explosion takes place, it sees uh, that this barrage was fired by Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And then on top of that, the IDF did something which is very, very unusual, something that it does not like to do, and it released an intercepted communication between two Hamas terrorists. They were either talking on the radio or some encrypted, you know, system. Um, and the fact that this was released is telling the enemy that, you know, military intelligence has the ability to to listen in on, on, on these people. And, and that's why they're very reluctant to do it. But they did it because 
the consideration was that the strategic harm that was being caused in the state of Israel in real time had to be countered with the truth. And in that conversation, which I'm sure you know you've heard and, and many of the viewers have already heard, we hear two Hamas terrorists very clearly saying that this was a Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket that fell short. Now, the incredible thing to me is that when you look at the fact that 450 uh, rockets in this war since October 7th have fallen short, malfunctioned, um, the fact that this would be excluded so quickly from the international narrative as the most likely scenarios is, is, is just incredible to me. So, of course, when you you know piece all these puzzle pieces together, the idea of spokespersons unit actually, you know, I have to commend it. It worked very quickly. Uh, in the past, it would take it much longer to do this. And here they really, you know, went all out, all hands on deck to try and get uh, an initial assessment out into the world. And they were about two, two and a half hours behind uh, this libel that was spreading around the world against Israel. They were able to counter it. And and then the responsibility goes back to, you know, the international media about how to correct the coverage. They all did it in their own way. I wasn't even tracking many of them because I was, you know, obviously busy with other things. But, but uh, it's a very difficult situation. It's much harder for an organized military to verify these things um, than it is for a terrorist organization that has no uh, care for for you know what actually happened. Yeah, but you, but you see how the the pretext uh, actually affects uh, the the military situation uh, because you had all kind of militants using this uh, supposed attack, accused attack, as a pretext for for all kinds of violent scenarios. Uh, both inside Israel's borders uh, in Gaza and potentially in southern Lebanon, and also in other countries, we saw attacks uh, on the Jordan uh, on the Israeli embassy in Jordan. We saw potential attacks, uh, attempted attacks on the Israeli embassy in Turkey uh, and elsewhere. And and we saw that uh, King Abdullah of Jordan uh, canceled the summit that was supposed to take place uh, with. Uh, together with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi and uh, Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas uh, and U.S. President Joe Biden. Uh, so they used this uh, all as a pretext uh, of really changing the entire scenario. And and you had Hezbollah calling for uh, you know a, a day of rage uh, today. Um, has there been any indication that today uh, that there was any kind of a day of rage uh, on on any of the direct fronts that Israel's fighting? Not on any of the direct fronts because, uh, you know, Hezbollah um, has its own plan and decision making. And what it's going to do is it's going to look for justifications. This is largely for public consumption, you know, for its Shiite uh, um, um, base in southern Lebanon, as well as the larger Lebanese public. They will use this uh, as a justification, but it's not actually going to affect their decision making because they are uh, in close contacts with the Iranians, with the IRGC, and they are deciding from day to day their level of involvement um, and how far to activate the Northern Front. Um, and and this is these are justifications. We did, by the way, also see attacks on synagogues uh, in Berlin. There was a firebombing of a synagogue. I think Jewish communities in the diaspora are certainly feeling threatened. Uh, by this libel and the effects of it around the world, I think they're actually uh, the most at risk from it um, because they have the least uh, level of defense, organized defense at their disposal. Um, but as far as the war fronts that we're currently uh, dealing with in Israel, uh, I didn't see any um, direct effect other than the attempt to control the narrative. You know, we are in, these, uh, in this war dealing with also a battle of narratives and there was an attempt uh, by Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, all of their allies and all of their proxies to use this to really try and make the world, you know, forget what started this war, the mass murder of 1,400 Israelis, uh, uh, the uh, war crime, the unprecedented war crime that was committed against the southern communities on October the 7th. This is just the kind of event that they're going to try and use to make the international community forget how this war started and why it's continuing. Yeah, it's this uh, all started when it hit me back uh, scenario that, that takes place across the Middle East. Um, and it was a completely unprovoked attack. I mean, Israel was really caught, uh, so to speak, with its pants down. It did not want to enter a war uh, this week. It was, I think, war was the furthest thing from anybody's mind. And, and yet there was a, just a horrific uh, intelligence and security breach uh, that, that enabled one of the worst massacres on Israeli soil. Uh, to take place, and Israel has found itself 
uh, you know, on on the verge of of a major war. Uh, maybe you could tell me a little bit about the the call up, um, the morale in the military, and also the morale in the country uh, for an operation. And then afterwards, we'll we'll talk a little bit about uh, where the operation stands. Sure. Well, according to you know what can be reported, and and not everything can be because of course uh, the military does not want to give the enemy too much information. Uh, but but the reserve divisions that are at the staging areas on on the border with the Gaza Strip are beyond uh, full capacity. In other words, more than 100% of people called up. Um, the figure that I have is 120% of, of people, um, reservists have showed up. So that means that people simply volunteered and didn't even wait for the call up. And that tells you uh, about the morale. The morale and the fighting spirit in the state of Israel could not be higher. I don't think it could it could technically be higher in any way. Everybody, why, why is that? Well, because I think it's clear to everybody that this is a war for the continuity of the state of Israel, for its ability to continue to exist in the Middle East. That there is a genocidal um, ISIS-like entity in the Gaza Strip that follows a modern version of of the Nazi ideology. It acted on that ideology, and that the state of Israel has absolutely no choice but to physically and uh, and systematically remove this threat um, as it exists today from the Gaza Strip. It, it simply couldn't be clearer that this is the need, this is the mission. I mean, I think that that is being translated into, into the incredibly high morale and fighting spirit uh, that we're seeing. And if anything, I would say, you know, the mid-ranking field officers and, and of course the soldiers themselves, both the conscripts and the reserves, reservists, the message from them is to the government, don't stop us before we get the job done. I'm hearing that message again and again, and I think it's 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 just shows you know what the the spirit of the country uh, is right now, and and where it, you know where people want to see this war go, which is the and elimination I, of Hamas. And I think it's there's there's a big difference between what Israelis are feeling right now and, and the morale in the country versus what the rest of the world is perceiving is the difference between uh, this conflict and previous rounds. Yes, I, certainly Hamas uh, scored a much greater hit than it has in the past, but uh, around the world, people are really perceiving this as just the latest round uh, in a conflict between Israel and Gaza, between Israel and Palestinians at large, and for Israelis, though, the paradigm has totally shifted. And, and I think that there's been a little bit of a disconnect there because people do around the world do think that they can pressure Israel to you know do what they've done every time, which is retaliate a bit, you know, and put try to put the jihadi genie back in the bottle and and kick the can down the road until the next round, uh, which will be in six months or a year. But the the situation in Israel has completely changed and Israelis are not willing to go back to that status quo of just kicking the can down the road. That's right. The the slogan, you know, of never again has become very contemporary, uh, which also talks, you know, to us about it. It's a signal of, of where the national mood is, that uh, that a Holocaust era, era uh, slogan is, is now uh, coming back. Because really, never again are Israelis willing to coexist uh, next to an entity like Hamas, sworn to the destruction of the state, its civilians and soldiers without any uh, attempt to distinguish between the two. And the fact that, you know, we finally saw this ideology being played out physically, you know, the systematic elimination of, of toddlers, uh, of, 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 of parents, children, of their grandparents, the kidnapping of these people, it makes it clear that if the state of Israel is interested in its long-term continuity, it will have to not only show its enemies what happens when death squads are sent uh, over the border into Israel, but also it has to show the Israeli people. Um, that any any entity that does this cannot continue to exist. Um, so it's really uh, goes to the very core of, of what security and defense uh, are about, and that is the ability to assure the country's continuity and long term existence. Um, and therefore, it's really it really is a change of a paradigm. Anybody who thinks that this is another round, I think, is going to find themselves sorely mistaken. The cabinet has already said. That the objective is the destruction of Hamas's military and governing capabilities. That means that Israel will not allow Hamas to continue to govern 
uh, this trip either. Not only its military wing will be destroyed, um, but also the political regime and the symbols of, of the regime, all of the various ministries. You know, there are tens of thousands of, of government employees in, in that work for the Hamas regime. Um, they're not going to have anywhere to go to when this war is over. Um, so that's the mood. That's the objective. Um, and I think anything less than that will just be seen to be completely unacceptable by by the Israeli people. Right. And you mentioned that uh, you know Israel doesn't want to live next to a regime like this that could carry out these acts, that have the motivation to carry out these acts. But Israel doesn't live next to just one uh, entity that has the military capacity and the motivation. You know, we Obviously, Hezbollah sits uh, to Israel's north, and by all accounts, Hezbollah is a much stronger uh, enemy than than even Hamas was. And we've seen over the last several days uh, skirmishes taking place along the northern border. There's been uh, anti-tank guided missiles uh, that have uh, hit Israeli posts and and even murdered Israelis. Tell us a little bit about what's going on on the on the northern border. So what we're seeing is a very uh, calculated decision by Hezbollah, which has been uh, made in consultation with the Iranians. We saw the Iranian foreign minister in Beirut just a few days ago and Iran really synchronizing its entire access. Um, and Hezbollah is the main uh, flagship of the Iranian-led access in this region. And what Hezbollah has decided to do is to escalate the Lebanese arena in order to force Israel to divert resources, attention, energy capabilities from Gaza up north. Um, and it's really attempting to play this harassing role. And um, we shouldn't use that word lightly because we've already had uh, several Israeli casualties from these attacks and Hezbollah itself has sustained at least seven known casualties on its own. So in, in any other day, this would be considered the start of, uh, of, a, of a conflict. But in this context, what we're seeing is Hezbollah attempting to harass Israel and to display solidarity with Hamas as a fellow member of the Iranian-led jihadist access. Um, I think what needs to be said on top of that is that if this escalates into war, Hezbollah has, in, to my mind, clearly made the decision that it's prepared to take that risk, that it is not deterred by the scenario of this escalating further into war. And the reason I think that's important is because we were hearing at the beginning of this war that Hezbollah is not interested and it doesn't want to drag Lebanon into devastation. And I personally believe, you know, in my in my sort of analysis, that one of the first lessons that we have to draw away from this uh, entire period is that all assumptions about the cost benefit calculations of of these uh, uh, jihadist uh, Islamist entities, whether they're Hamas or Hezbollah, uh, they that that control territory and that use that territory to build a terrorist army. Any assumptions that you know people may have had about um, their unwillingness to drag their populations into war, to uh, bring physical and economic and, and political devastation on them, all of those assumptions need to be thrown away. All of them need to be put into the uh, trash can of history, um, so to speak, because uh, Hamas has proven very clearly that it's not true. And, and if we look at Hezbollah's behavior over the past year, I think we also see signals that those assumptions are equally untrue for Hezbollah. Now, I'm not saying uh, that war right now with Hezbollah is inevitable. That's an unknown. Um, but I am saying that Hezbollah and Iran will make decisions based on their interest. And if those decisions lead to war, they are not deterred by that scenario. So the situation as, as, as it stands today is an escalated northern arena, which could escalate much further. Um, and 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 the uh, Israeli ground forces focused on the Gaza Strip, likely to be going in. You know, any time the order could be given, and I would expect uh, Israeli air power to be the first responder, so to speak, to a major escalation from the north. Um, and we're also seeing, you know, very high levels of deployment in the north as well, right now as a defensive posture in order to prevent the kind of cross-border invasion by death squads, because Bala has its own elite Red One unit, uh, which basically, you know, all of the things we saw Hamas do in Gaza uh, was a copy of what Hezbollah had been planning to do in, in the Galilee. Uh, Hamas simply did it first. So Hezbollah lost an element of surprise there, um, and we're seeing very, you know, heavy concentration of, of forces on the ground to prevent that, the evacuation of all communities up to the five-kilometer 
uh, border, which I think should have happened much sooner, but it's good that it's happening. And and that's that's where we're we're at right now. Well, Hezbollah they have a weapons cache of uh, over one hundred and fifty thousand uh, rockets and missiles, and many of them are uh, much more sophisticated than the Qassam rockets that Hamas has uh, in the Gaza Strip. Long range missiles, precision guided, can deliver much higher payloads, uh, and and also they have the capacity to fire them. Uh, you know, with some more sophisticated firing infrastructure than than the more crude firing systems in the Gaza Strip. Um, and I've heard many uh, military analysts and, and former former military uh, personnel and experts say that if if Israel wants to protect the home front uh, from any coming barrage of Hezbollah missiles, which could do immense damage to the home front, that the the appropriate step would be a preemptive strike to take out as many of these missiles as possible before they're starting to fight it. That even several hours before the missiles come, if they're already starting to being hit, be be hit by the IDF by the Israeli Air Force, that that could mitigate damage inside the Israeli home front. And by contrast, if Hezbollah starts firing uh, these missiles first before the Israeli Air Force attacks that that could uh, lead, unfortunately, to to much more damage. And also at the same time, that there's not necessarily enough missile defense to be shooting these missiles out of the sky if they're coming in rapid fire. So tell me, what do you think are the the calculations for Israel? It, it would seem as though the Hezbollah front is, is a much more dangerous front. They've already attacked uh, Hamas and, and have them, you know, in a sense at bay. I mean, they're firing rockets for sure, but they're not going to come across the border anymore. Shouldn't most of the attention be shifted towards uh, towards Hezbollah at this point? Look, you you put your finger on a very important strategic dilemma. I'll just before I get to some of my thoughts on on you know the very important question that you raised, I'll just say that you know from approximately 2013 onwards, when uh, the Al Sisi government took power in Egypt and really started sealing off the border between Sinai and Egypt and Gaza. Uh, Hamas shifted to a domestic rocket production program with Iranian know-how, with Iranian funding. But the the domestic arms factories in the Gaza Strip are extensive. And they produce, um, beyond Qassam's, also grad-level rockets and rockets that have ranges of 120 kilometers, 150 kilometers, and some rockets that can reach Haifa and beyond. And some of those rockets have uh, large payloads. Um, and of course, the arsenal is, is smaller. We don't have exact estimates, but I, you know, we've seen estimates of Hamas and PIJ combined having approximately twenty thousand uh, uh, in the Gaza Strip, and and all of this is much smaller than the arsenal uh, in Lebanon, which we can talk about. And, and you've correctly noted the, the difference. But I think Hamas is certainly pacing itself and preparing to unleash heavy barrages when the ground operation begins, because. What it's aiming for Hamas is is some sort of victory picture, and the way that Hamas defines victory is very, very different from the way a Western mind typically defines victory. And having those heavy barrages, which it's keeping close to its chest now, I think is part of the image that they're going to uh, want to create in the minds of Palestinians and 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 Muslims around the world. Um, now, having said that, yes, Hezbollah, of course, is poses a far greater uh, threat to the security of the state of Israel. First and foremost, because Unlike Gaza, the projectiles that Hezbollah has are mostly imported from Iran, and that means that they were produced in Iranian missile and rocket factories. And the Iranian defense industry, um, you know, by any measure, is an extremely uh, serious defense industry with huge budgets, and these are industrially produced uh, uh, um, projectiles that are, are made by a regional power with a very large budget. So that automatically makes them more powerful. Now, in addition to all of that, Hezbollah has precision guided missiles. And that is a game changer because you don't need a whole lot of those in order to cause serious pain to a country. You know, the difference between firing a rocket at a city and hoping that, you know, it gets to to the sort of five kilometer radius of a city and the ability to fire a precision guided missile or a rocket that you've converted into a missile with this guidance kit. And being able to hit, you know, within a few meters, the difference is night and day. Uh, with with an accurate missile um, arsenal, Hezbollah can function basically like a country that has an, an enemy country that has an air force, and they can direct strikes at very sensitive, strategic 
uh, points within the country, and anybody can use their imagination and think about the kind of targets that they probably already have drawn up. Um, so that you know leads us to your question of a preemptive strike. Now, look, I obviously don't know what the IDF's operational plans are, and I think it's important to just put that on the table before we talk about these scenarios. I'm talking purely from a theoretical perspective. Um, there is a strategic dilemma here for the state of Israel. If Israel could have it its way, um, it would not fight a full uh, multi-front war at the same time. In other words, a full-scale war with Hamas and Hezbollah at the same time, for the very simple reason that it's easier to take on one opponent than two. You know, you can compare this, you know, even to uh, uh, um, a boxing match. It's going to be easier to have one opponent than two. Um, Hezbollah has its own calculations in, in both directions. Hezbollah is aware of Israel's desire to focus on Hamas, and it's exploiting that desire in the north. But if I think, you know, Israeli decision makers see that the situation is rapidly escalating in the north and the coming days will be the litmus, litmus test for that, then there will be a temptation, in my opinion, and this is purely based on my own assessment and not anything else, there could be a temptation to preempt with an unprecedented wave of airstrikes as one option. They could just as well, of course, choose not to do that. I just, you know, it's it's very, we're in very sensitive times and it's important for me to, again, stress that these are purely my own assessments. Um, but whoever strikes first in the Israeli Hezbollah standoff will have an operational advantage. There is no doubt about that. What comes after is, is fairly unpredictable. Um, certainly the precision guided missile uh, uh, arsenal, uh, that, that part of Hezbollah's arsenal is the most threatening part of, of, the, of what exists in Lebanon. It's spread out across the whole of Lebanon. It's in southern Lebanon, in those 180 Shiite villages that are the main operational center of gravity for, gravity for Hezbollah. It's in Beirut. It's in the Beka Valley, which is in eastern Lebanon. The whole of Lebanon has, has been turned uh, into one large Hezbollah Iranian rocket and missile arsenal. Um, and yes, you know, the numbers you gave are, are, are correct. And if you add mortars to that, it's even higher. It approaches uh, 200,000. Um, so the firepower challenge from Lebanon is great. But I would also add that, and I think this is also important to point out, um, we have not seen the Israeli Air Force at any stage, not during this war and not in recent years, apply its full force. We haven't seen that. There are many, many reasons for that. Um, but the bottom line is that if the Israeli Air Force did receive an order to unleash the full capability of its firepower, the number of targets that would be struck, which would be many thousands within, you know, within a day and day and day in and day out would be unprecedented. I think both the precision and the extent and the scope would change the face of, of, of Lebanon um, and would be unprecedented in the region. Um, and I think Hezbollah is, is very likely aware of that capability, and they have to factor that in as well. So that's also something to keep in mind. The threat is a two-way threat here. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, the intelligence? Uh, you know, it, it seems as though Hamas is able to store these rockets, you know, under schools, under mosques, and, you know, it's been already more than a week since Hamas has started firing, and it, and it seems clear that the Israeli Air Force has not been able to uh, has not been able to eliminate the entire uh, rocket rocket arsenal of Hamas, which would lead uh, to believe that there's not su there's not sufficient intelligence to know where all these things are located. Uh, but I I do understand it, and we've discussed this a little bit in the past that the intelligence about where some of these long range missiles might be stored uh, in southern Lebanon is a little bit better. Can you go into a little bit of that dynamic? So the first thing I would say is that nobody can um, repress or extinguish rocket fire with air power alone. We should put that up as a rule of thumb. You know, the, the thumbed message on top of this entire discussion, it is not possible to extinguish rocket fire with air power alone. The only thing that can extinguish uh, rocket fire, whether it's from Gaza or Lebanon, is a full ground offensive that will take over the territory, destroy the bunkers, destroy the command and control, destroy and locate the rocket launching positions. Without that, not all the air power in the world will be able to stop this because these rockets and missiles have been planted ahead of time. Many of them function on timers. Many of them can be activated with internal circuitry. Um, and it's it, it's not possible to do it from the air. The air power is very damaging for, for Hamas. It is losing a growing number of capabilities, but like most terror armies that we're dealing with in, you know, in the region, and that includes others uh, in other places, but 
Uh, they're embedded and decentralized in civilian areas. So even if you decapitate their leadership and even if you take out a growing list of their command and control and bunkers, these decentralized cells can continue to operate until they're told not to or until they can't. Um, and that's why for both cases, for both arenas, uh, Lebanon and Gaza, and only a ground offensive can fully extinguish rocket fire. Um, in terms of intelligence, look, here I'm going to assumptions and and, not, and, and nothing more than that. I would assume uh, the Israeli military intelligence director and other intelligence agencies would in very heavily over many years into mapping out the, the precision guided missiles. Few of these, by the way, are converted. Some of these were converted. Uh, they were they were brought into Syria by Iran, converted into missiles. Some of them on Syria, on Lebanese soil, um, and a lot of those accepted along the way. By the way, during during so my guess is that there is a large data bank of intelligence. The Israeli Air Force knows where most targets are located and can hit them. Beyond that, uh, I don't know. So you have on the one hand the desire to uh, fight one battle at a time. You have on the other hand uh, Hezbollah, which is testing the waters uh, in the north and a situation that could at any moment, it, it could only take one trigger-happy jihadi and a decentralized uh, terrorism uh, system to push your finger on the button and start sending uh, long range missiles into into Israel and and launching you know a second a second front. Um, is is there is there a little bit of negligence on Israel's part in assuming that it, it should wait and only deal with one front at a time? That's on the one. And number two is uh, we saw that it did take days uh, to mobilize uh, troops around the mm -hmm. Gaza envelope. Uh, and if Hezbollah starts firing, it it might require a much, much faster mobilization uh, to go into southern Lebanon. Is the IDF currently mobilized uh, to attack a second front, even as it pro clearly prefers not to be fighting a second front at the same time? Sure. And just before I get to that, a clarification on the decentralization part of this. They're decentralized in the sense that they can operate, you know, in their in their respective sectors and and, and they can do so quite independently, but they do take orders. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, you could have the scenario that you just described is, is absolutely possible, but they do they do take orders. And as long as the, they have a command structure, which both Hamas and Hezbollah do, they will take orders from from their senior uh, commanders. Um um, regarding the the negligence question, I think you know what we have here is a collapse of an entire assumption. And the assumption was that if Israel knows about the intentions of these adversaries that have spent years building terror armies on the borders, then it will be able to, in real time, deploy its forces accordingly. And this reliance on knowing the intention has collapsed. Um, and I think one of the first lessons that will that the defense establishment will learn as it uh, recovers from this terrible, uh, terrible blow. And this will begin after the war, in my opinion, because right now all of the energies are going into fighting the war, is that the enemy needs to be measured based on its capability and not its intention. In other words, we always have to assume the worst. And, and, and the goal has to be, first of all, to deny them capabilities, not to let them build up capabilities in the first place. And if they have built capabilities, a, that's already a failure going forward, and especially in the case of the Gaza Strip. You know, I fully expect the, when this war ends for the Israeli military to continue to operate in the Gaza Strip on a regular basis, conducting security raids to deny Hamas the ability to rebuild its capabilities, its terrorist army. And and that's a, that's absolutely a must. I think it's non-negotiable. doesn't uh, matter, I think, right now how that would work in terms of details, whether the raids are launched from Israel, whether military bases are established in the Gaza Strip, you know, those can be looked at later. But as a principle, mowing the lawn is will be critical in Gaza going forward. And and in Lebanon, we have to see what happens, but the same assumptions hold true. So I think, you know, in order to really learn the lessons going forward, we will have to judge enemies based on capabilities and to stop trying to constantly figure out uh, what their intentions are. I think, you know, that would enable essentially solve 
um, the, what, you, what you're describing as negligence, which is, you know, allowing the capabilities to be built up and then trying to guess when they would be applied and how they would be applied. So I right. think that, I mean, that was the, you know, that was the considerations until now. Okay, fine. Yes, we exactly. allowed, and Israel allowed in both cases, Hamas and Hezbollah to amass tremendous capacity. But now we're beyond the point right. of amassing capacity. Now we're seeing, A, that Hamas, uh, you know, went through any perceived Israeli deterrence, launched an attack. Uh, that there is coordination to a certain extent between Hamas and Hezbollah, and they could decide uh, to go into battle at the same time. And there's already been, Hezbollah has been actively threatening that uh, if Israel puts troops on the ground inside Gaza, that it would open up a second front. The Iranians are saying That's that, right. they would, that they would launch preemptive attacks. So we're not now in a guessing game as to if Hezbollah would get involved. We're, we're as you, you stated, I think, accurately earlier, Hezbollah is potentially willing to get involved. And not only are they potentially willing to get involved, but there's already cross-border uh, firing taking place, both by Hezbollah and the IDF. So moving yes. into going from that point into full-scale conflict in, in within the current situation is not the same calculations as, as in a quiet period, guessing whether Hezbollah would want to start something. So yes. it is, is the IDF prepared you know, for... If this, if Hezbollah front will become a will become a full fledged active battlefield, is is the IDF mobilized right now to to, to be able to to introduce troops and air power into southern Lebanon on a moment's notice? Yeah. So look, when you look at the ground forces, you know, um, and generally the fact that you know three hundred and fifty or so thousand reservists were called up, I don't think all of them were called up for the Gaza Strip. Certainly. There are large numbers of forces deployed on the northern border with Lebanon. And if there is a need to fight two fronts at the same time, the IDF is, is designed to do that. And, you know, if we look back at history in the 20th century, the IDF has always actually done that. You know, the 1967 Six Day War, three fronts, the Yom Kippur War, which began with uh, with a surprise, but two front war, the multiple, multiple front warfare is a core feature of the IDF. And it has designed and built itself to be able to do that. Um, but there is also an attempt to prioritize because that contributes to operational effectiveness. Now, because of the situation that we're in now, um, with this need to uh, extinguish the threat in the Gaza Strip um, as, a, as a clear and, and, and immediate objective, the preference, in my opinion, will be to do that so long as that is deemed possible. But if the conclusion, and I don't know what the threshold is. I don't know what, you know, the Northern Command and the Security Cabinet and the General Staff, what they've set as their threshold. That, that That's unknown. But there is a, th a certain threshold, and it has been set. And if it's crossed, then I think we will see, as I've said, first of all, massive amounts of aerial firepower directed at Hezbollah and, and possibly some sort of ground uh, maneuver as well. Poss um, I would expect that to be much uh, smaller in the first steps, in the first stages of a northern war than would be the case in any other time because we are a stretch between these two fronts and, and Gaza is still right now the priority. Um, but the capabilities are in place for massive aerial firepower and ground forces uh, to deal with a northern front if necessary. There's no question in my mind that they're there, they're mobilized, they're deployed, the numbers are there, and the operational readiness is now there. Um, what happens going forward, that's largely unknown uh, at this stage. And it's really, the I think, the biggest question mark of this war. You know, as we as we transition into the next stage of this war, and I think we're we're doing that now, we're, we're leaving the first stage, we're going to the second stage, the extent of other fronts, mainly Lebanon, but I'll also, you know, remind everybody, we have other in this arena as well. Uh, there are um, uh, Shiite militias in Iraq that very likely have uh, Iranian supplied missiles, ballistic missiles. The Houthis in Yemen have some firepower that can reach a lot. Uh, and Syria, which is an arena that is actually much more under control because of this shadow war that Israel has been launching, this mowing the lawn from an aerial perspective, constantly striking Iranian attempts to set up a second Hezbollah in Syria. Um, but there are still threats in Syria. There are missiles there um, that can reach Israel. So we have a multi-front uh, uh, possibility, 
Um, but the biggest question, without any any uh, doubt, is is the extent to which the Northern Arena will become involved, and and we'll have the answer, in my opinion, really in the coming days. I don't think it will take very long for us to to know which way it's going to go. You, you just referenced the external fronts, but there's also internal fronts, right? We there's been uh, over the last two years, in particular, a, a tremendous rise uh, in terrorism. Uh, within Israel and, and particularly within uh, Judea and Samaria. And, and there's been numerous operations that the IDF has conducted inside the Area A uh, in various cities like like Nablus, and, and, uh, which is known in Israel as Shlem also, and, uh, and in Janine and, and other places. We, we saw last night uh, rioting in, in Hebron and in, in Hebron and uh, in in. And, and then in addition to what you have in Judea and Samaria, where where some of these terror groups are active, even though much smaller uh, than, than they are in Gaza, um, that could that could heat up. But then we also have the the situation in the mixed Arab Israeli cities. You know, there's 250,000 yeah. residents uh, in in Jerusalem and they live in a basically in a contiguous zone. I was just speaking to a, a taxi driver that was taking me the other day. As sixty-five-year-old taxi driver who's from Jabal Mukabar, which is known to be one of the more radicalized uh, villages in in the area, and I asked him, I said, "Is are things going to be quiet?" And he said, "If there's going to be troops on the ground in Gaza, it will not be quiet." Um, so, mm -hmm. in addition to, you know, in addition to to all the fronts you mentioned, the 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 main ones being Hamas and Hezbollah, but also Syria, also Iraq, also the Iranian Revolutionary Guards themselves, also the Houthis in Yemen. You also have a situation brewing in Judea and Samaria that's required IDF attention, and you could also have a situation uh, inside mixed Arab-Israeli cities. So, it, it, is the IDF and the police are they mobilized for for all these scenarios, especially with the possibility that they could they could all come to the surface at the same time? Uh, well, the, the short answer is is yes. There have been many battalions that have been sent both internally within Israel and Judea and Samaria to deal with exactly those scenarios. Um, there are a few things I think that make this different from 2021 when we really saw that uh, internal arena, um, as you correctly call it, um, explode into violence. The fact that um, these Hamas death squads killed a significant number of uh, Arab Israelis, including Bedouin, in their attack, um, I think has really changed the dynamics. And, uh, you know, if Hamas was hoping to ignite the Arab Israeli street, uh, I don't think he could have chosen a worse way. To go about it than the uh, indiscriminate killing of Arab Israelis, which these death squads did. Um, and that may help explain why so far, and you know, we can only talk about what has happened so far. We we can't know what's going to happen. So far, we have not seen uh, those scenes repeat itself uh, within the Green Line, within these mixed cities. We haven't seen it. Um, and long may that continue. Um, that would be, of course, in everybody's interest for that not to happen. Um, and and we have to see how that how that plays out. Now, in Judea and Samaria, uh, of course, the situation is extremely tense. But again, this is a this is a place where the IDF continuously mows the lawn. That is why the degree of security control there is 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 so much higher than in other places, and why we don't have a terrorist army in Judea and Samaria, despite Hamas's attempts to build one, these continuous attempts, and Iran has attempted to flood uh, Judea and Samaria with. Uh, IEDs, weapons, drugs that can be sold uh, and then exchanged in exchange for money that's used to fund terrorist cells. We've obviously seen an Iranian attempt to ignite Judea and Samaria. Um, and Hamas, I think, is very much hoping to see that ignition. I, I would guess that right now Hamas's leadership is, is pretty disappointed in what it's seeing in Judea and Samaria. I think they were expecting far more violence and acts of solidarity than what have been the case. And we have, we have had disturbances and security incidents, of course, but I think Hamas was hoping for a much higher uh, rate of those because it wants to take over uh, Judea and Samaria. It wants to uh, topple the Fatah-run Palestinian Authority, just like they did in Gaza in 2007, when, when they killed about 130 of them and, and raided and, and took over their positions in this, in this coup, this Islamist coup. They want to repeat that. Um, and so far, that isn't happening. The destabilization that they had hoped would happen has so far not materialized in either one of these arenas. Jerusalem, as you absolutely correct to point out, is a major uh, uh, sub arena. You could call it. It's you know nestled in between uh, the two place, two regions that we've just been discussing. Obviously, very very sensitive, 
And the police say that, you know, they're fully mobilized. Um, they, and the military has sent them battalions, backup battalions, because the level of reservists called up is so high that it's able to do that. It's able to shift forces across all of these arenas. Um, and so far, the situation appears to be relatively under control. We will have to say, as, 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 as your taxi driver noted, when boots hit the ground, that's when dynamics could start changing. Um, I think the North is the place to watch first and foremost, but of course, all of these other arenas are, are dynamic, unpredictable, and we will have to see how, how they develop over time. This is going to be a long war. It's, it's not going to be over in, in weeks. It's going to take months. Um, so we'll have to see how things play out. So talking about the primary arena and the question of uh, if and when boots go on the ground into the Gaza Strip, you know, there's been a lot of tension in the country uh, with 360,000 reservists uh, called up into duty. Every Israeli family member know, has a, a, a father, a brother, a son, a daughter, a best friend uh, that is now staged and ready to go in. And I think that there was a feeling here in Israel among many, that the uh, ground operation was going to happen and it was going to happen right away. And now, mm -hmm. of course, 10 days in, in the scope of history is not a lot of time. And, and perhaps judging at the end of this battle, as opposed to at the beginning, it's, it's not going to seem to have made much of a difference when Israel decided to go in or not. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, there is a feeling inside the country that, uh, that, Either the, the war cabinet wasn't sure if it wanted to go in, if there were logistical issues, which maybe you could discuss, um, but that the delay uh, doesn't send a strong message, not to the Israeli citizenship and, and potentially not to, uh, not to Israel's enemies that may be gathering from the hesitation that, that Israel's having cold feet about launching, launching an incursion. Can you tell me a little bit about why you think there's been a delay until now, uh, you know, and, and what has been taking place uh, with within this 10-day uh, period? Right. So, look, in terms of the timing of when the order is given, that's purely up to the security cabinet. And while I don't know what the deliberations have been uh, in the security cabinet, it's clear that as soon as President Biden announced his intention to visit, um, that was linked to the timing. There may be other factors involved, including the very, very complicated and tragic issue of the 200 or so hostages that are in the Gaza Strip and needing to know, you know, attempting to map out their location. This is my assumption uh, that, of course, that is going to be part of uh, knowing how to move into Gaza. You know, it, it's this is not going to be just another ground offensive. The fact that 200 people, um, our people, are in the Gaza Strip is going to have a huge uh, a, a role to play in the way this ground offensive plays out. Um, I also think that, you know, there were probably some voices that were trying to figure out whether uh, we were uh, walking into some sort of strategic trap, whether, you know, the ground forces would be tied down in Gaza, something could happen from the north, and there was greater intelligence gathering to figure out that side of things. I know that there have been voices, say, from the mid-ranking officers and the field officers saying, let us in, we're ready to go. Um, but ultimately, the timing is not up to the military. The military can make its recommendations. Um, it's a cabinet decision. Now, what I can say, what 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 seems to have been going on during this time is is two things on on both sides of the border. First of all, in Israel, it's fair to assume, you know, the IDF has been gathering more and more intelligence for its ground forces before they move in on the enemy. Um, that's naturally what they're going to be doing. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, I think the uh, the Hamas uh, terror army uh, could be doing one of two things. One, it could be in boosting its own fortifications, and that's and that's not good. And the second thing is that it could be at least some of it trying to send more of its forces into southern Gaza to continue this war under the guise of civilians that are moving south in line with the IDF's evacuation calls. So. The fact that hundreds of thousands of Gazans are listening to the IDF and not to Hamas and actually moving south, that is a vote of no confidence in the Hamas regime. They don't like that. They're trying to stop that, uh, both because of the way it looks and also because they're losing you know, a chunk of their human shields. And, and they obviously don't want those civilians to be better protected. They want them 
right at the edge of of Israel's military efforts in order to protect their uh, their own capabilities, as as distorted and 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 sick as it sounds to the Western mindset. The military is supposed to protect civilians. All over there in Gaza, the terror army attacks civilians and it hides behind its own civilians. It's a double war crime. Um, so the time you know that it's taking for this to go ahead has advantages and disadvantages, but ultimately I think Hamas has gained somewhat from that, um, and it's going to create another challenge for the ground forces as they move in. But, you know, if we look on the bright side, I think it's also going to improve the readiness, the training as well. You know, there's intensive combat training taking place by the Israeli forces on, on the border. That's also going to actually be quite beneficial for a lot of these reservists uh, who, who, you know, not all of them have, have been in training so frequently. So it plays both ways. But ultimately, I th- my personal opinion is the sooner this goes ahead, the better, the better it will be for Israel. And uh, are you getting indications from your sources that this is imminent? Is there a chance that, uh, you know, Israel will not send troops on the ground? So I'll answer both questions. I don't have indications about timing. Um, it's just not, well, I think we'll only know once, you know, the forces start moving. Um, I pr- believe there is no chance uh, at all of this ground offensive not taking place. The con- The consequences of any cancellation of that would be catastrophic, I think, strategically, domestically, in any which way you want to look at it. Um, I don't see any scenario that this doesn't happen. I would be shocked. Um, So I'm sure that it will. And I think we'll have to be a little bit more patient. um, And my hunch is that we won't have to wait for much longer. You think there's any uh, any topics here that that we've missed or? Maybe uh, we do have any questions that we want to take. Um, Looks like we've addressed most of the questions um you know so someone asks if the discussion is exposing information that should not be made public okay so uh everything i've said uh are things that have been uh cleared for publication i haven't gone into any details that um i know that i can't um so so the answer to that is gladly no and i'm very careful for that and you know, before anything else, I'm I'm a citizen of the state of Israel, and Israeli security is the most important thing to me. So, uh, people can rest assured that uh, I'm very strict and meticulous with that. I guess uh, another question I'd ask is that the United States has sent over, uh, you know, two U.S. aircraft carriers, uh, which could provide a significant uh, air power uh, and, and other infrastructure uh, if was needed, and it's it's been uh, reported that. Up to 2,000 troops could be ready to come to the region in uh, what would be considered a non-combat uh, environment. Tell me a little mm-hmm. bit about uh, about the the U.S.-Israel military relationship, what the sending of those aircraft carriers does, uh, and if you could see at some point uh, the United States actually getting involved in a war, particularly if it became a, a multi-front endeavor. So, you know, alongside the fact that the U.S. is sending munitions and military equipment and and obviously making itself very present in the region with these two carrier strike groups moving into the Mediterranean, um, the U.S. potentially has uh, a number of roles it could play. First of all, if Hezbollah joins the war, we could see, and this is something that the U.S. military has been practicing for years with it, the IDF, uh, the U.S. coming in and assist with air defense. And the U.S. has the ability to very rapidly get uh, a host of top-line air defense systems both to the Israeli coastline and, and, and at sea, and they can help Israeli air defense systems cope cope with that onslaught. Um, beyond that, look, I think it's important to say that, you know, Israel, its entire defense doctrine is being able to defend itself by itself. So, you know, that leaves open the question when President Biden says, you know, don't, as he's telling Hezbollah and Iran, well, what would happen if they do? And that's an unknown. I think that the way I read the situation is if Iran became directly involved in this war, then that, I believe, would expose it to American firepower. If Iran, which has the Middle East's largest uh, missile arsenal, um, the largest, the most diverse, we talked about their defense industry, if Iran directly becomes involved, uh, I I think that that could uh, quite potentially uh, trigger a U.S. involvement. I don't think the U.S. would become involved beyond the level of air defense when it comes to Hezbollah. Um, I have my doubts about that, but 
remains to be seen. But what I'm sure has happened is with the blessing of President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu and the cabinet and the Pentagon is that the two militaries have gamed out uh, multiple escalation scenarios and set up thresholds uh, for U.S. involvement. And, and we don't know what those are. We don't, I, I've offered some some guesses, uh, you know, in my last comments, and, 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 and we'll have to see, you know, how that plays out. But just the very presence of those carrier strike groups is a message of deterrence. It's a message of solidarity. Uh, I think it's very important for the entire region, for the Israeli people, for our adversaries to see that. And, uh, you know, if deterrence doesn't work, then force has to be activated. And then, and then we'll see, you know, we'll have to see how that plays out. And you pivoted into my next question regarding Iran. Uh, you know, perhaps there's a, a bit of a blessing here that this conflict has erupted uh, but potentially in the last days or weeks before Iran uh, is operating under a nuclear umbrella, becomes a full-fledged nuclear power. Uh, obviously, there's been reports for many years that uh, Israel was uh, considering the potential of striking Iranian nuclear infrastructure Um if this conflict remains isolated to the south and Hamas, you know, I, w- I would have a hard time believing that uh, Israel would even consider at this moment uh, striking against Iranian nuclear infrastructure. But if all of a sudden mm-hmm. this becomes a multi-front war and it's clear that Iran is the head of a terrorist snake with Hezbollah and Hamas as its two largest tentacles uh, you know, around Israel, are there battle plans drawn up? Uh, is the possibility uh, being discussed that Israel could uh, strike at Iranian nuclear infrastructure uh, preemptively? Look, uh, it has been discussed for years. The, the Israeli Air Force is designed to fight on multiple fronts near and far. Um, it is definitely able and has built itself to be able to deal with uh, uh, Gaza, Lebanon, other arenas, and Iran all at the same time. Of course, it's not an ideal scenario, but uh, the Israeli Air Force had to have built those contingencies. Um, but I really think, you know, part of the American deterrent message is to Iran, don't see this as an opportunity to break out to nuclear weapons, which would take them, by the way, I think a little bit longer because they still haven't actually, according to, you know, what's known in the public sphere, um, um, built the actual atomic bombs. They've amassed a great amount of uranium, enriched uranium, and that's very alarming. That puts them in a threshold state. But from there to build a nuclear bomb is at least several months, according to most assessments, both American and Israeli. But they could try and break out. You know, they could see an opportunity. They see that everybody's busy with Gaza and possibly busy with Lebanon. And that and that goes back, you know, to Iran's grand strategy. Iran's grand strategy has been to encircle the state of Israel with terrorist armies, with firepower bases, keep Israel busy and bleeding, fighting around its borders, and keep Israel away in terms of resources, military intelligence capabilities, keep it distracted and, and away from Iran. Um, that has been a, a major Iranian strategic goal. And I think you know the fact that the timing of this happened just as Saudi-Israeli normalization, if we remember this in, in another world, you know, just a, a week and a half ago or so, was the headline story. I don't think that's a coincidence either. I think this was definitely uh, an attempt by Hamas and and likely with Iranian encouragement to sabotage that entire process, which the radical access viewed as a major threat to it. But setting the, setting uh, you know that aside, uh, the Iranians are, are are facing not only the state of Israel but also the United States. And I think that is what it gives Israel strategic depth and what will make the Iranians think twice before breaking out to a, a an attempted uh, nuclear weapon. Um, we have also seen, this is another thing that needs to be monitored, uh, reports of uh, Iranian-backed Shiite militias in Iraq attacking a U.S. base. And that's exactly the kind of proxy pattern that Iran prefers to operate through. So that's another thing to watch. Well... You know, I, I think that we've probably given a lot of the viewers uh, palpitations here. Uh, it's it's a very scary moment in Israel. Certainly, there's there's a tremendous amount of tension here on the home front with uh, with civilians, residents uh, running you know into bomb shelters, and there's been you know over one thousand three hundred funerals uh, in the last week here, and it's it's been it's been one of the the hardest moments, probably one of the longest ten days in Israeli history. Um, and yet, 
you as a military analyst, you've you've been studying the the military uh, strength you know, of the state of Israel, uh, its technology, its its capabilities. Is, is there anything that you could, uh, in your assessment, leave uh, the the viewers of this webinar on a positive note about about uh, what you think uh, Israel's uh, capabilities are and it's uh, the plausible, uh, you know, victory options uh, in, in any scenario. I believe um, without any doubt that Israel will defeat Hamas. Israel will destroy Hamas as a, as a terrorist army and as a regime. I have no doubt in my mind that it will achieve that objective. If push comes to shove, Israel can also level great devastation on Hezbollah. Um, and I think that, you know, anybody who is under the illusion that Israel is exercising its full uh, military power is is, is, is mistaken. Um, and, and Lebanon and Hezbollah may end up experiencing that or may not, but Israel has the ability to deal with both of these enemies at the same time. The start, you know, has been so difficult, so traumatic, and we're going to have years to process this as a, as a nation. And I think nothing will really be the same after this, but even despite that very dark and and and, and desperately sad and 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 infuriating enraging start, um, you know, we witnessed the massacre of our people um, in a way that we never thought we'd see. Despite all of that, um, the state of Israel militarily is strong. The military muscle that Israel can flex remains very strong, and Israel is recovering uh, from this shock, and it is about to go on the offensive not only air power wise, but I'm confident also on the ground. And when it begins to do that, I think the entire region will understand um, that Israel retains its military strength, that it's not going to hesitate to use it under these conditions. And that's the message that needs to be sent out to friends and foes alike. Um, Israel is strong. It will ultimately defeat its enemies. I don't doubt that. And I would urge our viewers to uh, you know, look at it from a long-term perspective. The way things look like now is is not the way things will look like in a couple of months from now, and the situation will be much much better for Israel uh, from a security uh, point of view. Well, I, I think that the viewers can see that they're getting uh, analysis on this con conflict and and the context uh, that that's led to this moment um, from us that that is far superior to to a lot of other sources. Um, in addition to covering all the military aspects, which Yaakov does so well, we're also covering the political aspects and the social aspects, the whole front aspects, and also covering the uh, response to this conflict around the world, particularly in the United States, uh, particularly within the, the U.S. Jewish community, uh, but also covering uh, the events that are taking place in, in other countries around the world. Um, it, it really has proven itself to be uh, much more of a global jihad than a localized one. Uh, and JNS is bringing you, you know, all the information that you need to process uh, what's happening and doing it in real time. We're really working around the clock. We were before this conflict, but uh, certainly since this conflict has started uh, last Saturday, we've been going at it uh, basically 24 or six uh, and, and working on on overdrive to to be providing uh, just a constant flow of, of continuously updated information. Now, JNS Jewish News Syndicate is a reader supported uh, not for profit news agency. We're not doing this to make a profit. There's there's no profits. There's no dividends here. It's it's all about uh, providing factual uh, information and reporting and, and critical analysis that you need to make good decisions about uh, what's going on. And also to counter the false narratives like we saw last night when JNS was one of the first outlets to report uh, from the moment that the IDF and the prime minister's office sent out uh, their, indi their indications that this was not uh, an IDF strike on the hospital. Uh, JNS was right there to the moment and, and we were we were in direct contact with IDF spokespersons and in the prime minister's office you know, waiting for those uh, messages to be confirmed. And, and as soon as they were, we, we were had our, our finger on the publish button. So we're really there to to correct the misinformation in, in real time and correct the false narratives. Um, and so uh, I do encourage people to to continue to read JNS on the day to day to subscribe to the newsletter. And if you're you're moved to support our activities, as I said, we're a reader supported ally. We couldn't do it without the support of our readership. So go to the website. Click on one of the links to, to make a contribution. 
uh, and one time and monthly contributions uh, go a long way to to supporting our continued efforts as well as our growth. I want to thank everybody for participating, especially want to thank uh, Jakob Lappin for providing what I think is uh, just an incredible uh, analysis of a very complex situation uh, and, uh, you know, wishing everybody uh, safety in where they are uh, and a quick and conclusive uh, end to this conflict that will, will strengthen the state of Israel for years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex.